Welcome to the Canada Innovate Podcast, the first ever podcast designed to showcase Canadian thought leadership. These innovators share industry insights, entrepreneurial best practices, lessons learned, and other tips that we can incorporate right into our lives, our careers, and our businesses. So let's get inspired. We are lucky we've got Michael Combe, who is the City of Toronto first ever Chief Transformation Officer. He's a seasoned executive with extensive experience in business transformation. Michael provides strategic leadership to help the city become more effective and efficient in its delivery of public services now and in the future, while delivering maximum value for public dollars. Michael's had a really super long and successful background in consulting with the powerhouse firms such as ENY and PwC, and he's worked with both the private and public sector clients to help plan and for and realize the benefits of implementing business transformation. So he is the perfect guy to be leading the chief transformation officer for City of Toronto. He's leading it and he's working very closely with internal and external leaders, partners, stakeholders to lead transformational projects that ultimately drive social, environmental and economic benefits for all those that live, work and play in Toronto. One of Michael's current focus areas is developing the Smart City Strategy, which includes leading the city submission to the Federal Smart Cities Challenge. You know, this episode is pretty special and dear to my heart because it is about City of Toronto and the transformation that it's going to. And we get into a really great conversation with Michael and he talks about what his key strategic vision is about how smart cities is going to play in there. We even start talking about Dr. Ann Kavokian because, I mean, obviously the privacy is uh, by design. She's going to definitely have a play into this. So she talks about this. We talk about a little bit more about what's his passion. He gives tips from his consulting days, which is like 20 years of industry best practices. And he gives us ideas and tips of what to make us more successful and so much more. Honestly, Michael is seriously an inspiration to listen to. And I think he's going to really help the city really transform itself in the years to come. So take a listen. Welcome, Michael. It's an absolute honor to have you on the podcast. I'm a huge fan of yours. You're doing some amazing things. And I'm really excited about your role as the first ever City of Toronto Chief Transformation Officer. Well, so, thank you very much, Tapna. It's really a pleasure to speak to you today. I'm excited about the opportunity to uh, to reach your audience and talk about what we're doing in Toronto. I think we're, we're doing some exciting things. And I'd, I'd love to talk to you about them. I'm excited because, first of all, I know this is the first question I had, but I'm sure other people have had, and, and they must have asked you this a million times. What exactly is a chief transformation officer? Well, it's, I, I have had that <laughs> question a million times. It's, uh, it, it's the first question we usually do get asked, and I, and I think probably because there aren't uh, there aren't many of us, or there, there's almost none of us uh, actually out in the public sector in other uh, cities and other levels of government. So, so it was a kind of a new idea. For, for municipal government, and I was re- pretty excited about uh, being able to get involved in this opportunity and, and, and perform this role in the city. But really what it is, is, uh, you know, when when uh, some of the city leadership and the mayor and others got together a few years ago and they looked at, well, you know, what were some of the bigger, bolder, transformational things we would like to do, and were we really structured in a way to deliver those effectively? Were there teams uh, in place, and were there people who weren't sort of really focused on the day-to-day sort of operational responsibilities here at the city that were thinking about bigger, broader transformational opportunities. So I think I was hired and and the office was formed about a year ago to really uh, identify and lead and drive those bigger, broader transformational uh, opportunities here in the city. And and we're we're really actually getting going on those now. That's amazing. That's amazing. I mean, there seems to be a lot of initiatives that are happening. So what are some of the key kind of transformation pieces that you're focusing on right now? Like, what does the vision look like? Yeah, so as I say, new office, new new job, new mandate. Uh, So we had to really get our head around, you know, what was already happening here? What were people getting frustrated with? You know, what were people getting excited about? What are some of the broader uh, societal changes that are driving the need to look at how we uh, do things differently, for example, digital and smart city and the way customers interact with us. So we put together a plan. It's really uh, kind of a, a six point plan. And, and if it's okay, maybe I'll run through those uh, with you. Absolutely. I'm dying to know. I mean, yes, absolutely. Please share. <laughs> yeah. So the first one I, I always talk about and, and in some way, you know, this that one isn't actually uh, being let out of my office, but it's, I think the most important one. I think we, be remiss if we didn't mention, and that is really we need to transform Toronto into a more resilient city. So we know that uh, the climate is changing. We know that that's going to have 
a number of impacts on our city just in terms of our built environment, our waterfront, our water systems, our other systems in the city, our transportation networks, and so on. We need to get ready for the impacts of climate change, and that's that's a massive transformation. And we actually hired a chief resilience officer at the same time I was hired um, to build a plan around that. So I did, I did want to mention that one. Um, the, the second one is really our operations and how we deliver our operational services. And you know, this is kind of the, the more back office type stuff. And, and you know, I get excited about this, uh, the, the back office and our, our effectiveness in terms of how we deliver our operational services and our operational programs. But, you know, we need to figure out ways to be more efficient and use public dollars more effectively. So we've got a whole bunch of different programs looking at that. I could give you a few examples. One of the ones we're working on is real estate. So uh, up until uh, prior to this year, all of the real estate assets in the city of Toronto were managed separately by different agencies and commissions and, and city divisions. As of January 1st, we created a new entity called Create TO. And Create TO is now the single place where all of the real estate assets are managed in, in the city of Toronto. So that's a good example of an operational operating model change. It's really broad and really bold and really changes the whole playing field here at the city. The third one is around supply chain. And again, this is kind of a back office thing, but it's really important. We spend almost $3 billion a year on goods and services uh, here at the city of Toronto, you know, buying from uh, private, basically from private companies. So we need to make sure that that money is being spent effectively. We need to make sure that we're making good decisions around who we partner with to deliver those goods and services. Um, and we need to be strategic about, you know, how much money we spend on different things. So there's a whole transformation going on around, around the supply chain and just being really effective about the money we spend on, on goods and services. The fourth one is customer service. So we're just like most other industries that have customer facing businesses and we have many many customer facing businesses here at the city we need to get more effective in terms of how we deliver those services we need to be able to deliver those services on digital platforms on mobile platforms we need to reduce the burden on sort of physical counters and people lining up and taking numbers in the old fashioned way that you would interact with your with your city government we need to really get bold in terms of segmenting our customers, identifying customer journeys, and figuring out what's a better way and how do we bundle services in better ways to deliver those services to to the residents of the city of Toronto. The fifth one is an exciting one for me and one you know one I'm really quite passionate about and that is the smart city transformation. So this is very and I have a very simple definition of smart city and and, and I've heard lots of them, but mine is quite simple and that is are we using uh, technology and data in in a way that provides better outcomes for for our residents? and really focusing on making life better for people that work, live, and play in the city of Toronto. I'm making, you know, I'm dealing with some of our big issues here around poverty and social inclusion and the environment and mobility and public safety and so on. And really, are we are we using technology and data in, in the most effective ways to deliver better outcomes on that front? And then the last one is, is pretty exciting to me as well, and that, and that is what I what I call our cultural transformation. So all those things I just talked about are sort of the way we deliver services and our operating model. But there's uh, some fundamental things about how how we behave and how we do our work here at the city and how we're organized to do that work at the city. So and, and that falls under a few headings, governance, change management, being very data driven and fact based, figuring out how to do partnerships better, figuring out how to embed innovation and use human centered design and design thinking in our work figuring out how to become better at experimenting and failing fast. So so those are really sort of fundamental behavioral aspects of how we do our work at the city that are going to be quite important for us moving forward and modernizing. Um, so that was a mouthful, Sapna, but uh, that's, that's really the overall plan. I'm happy to drill into specific areas of that. Well, no, it's amazing. Like, I honestly I hadn't even considered about those things about the climate changes that you have to deal with, you know, the poverty issues. The, I mean, smart city, you've seen quite a bit in the news, a bit bits and pieces of it. But, you know, the cultural transformation, like I was mentioning, my brother-in-law, he is so excited about all the things that are actually happening inside the city that, you know, the experimentation, the new ideas and looking at things differently like he's in, he feels like he's in, in wonderland a little bit because he's just like wow it's just everything is so much more open and you know i didn't consider all of those things because we also have the you know you're talking about is the better outcomes for our residents but i think about oh my gosh like we've got more senior citizens going to be happening the aging demographics and then you've got the complexity of all the new immigrants like that's a pretty <laughs> tall order of so much so much that's happening 
Yeah, it's, it's an amazing amount that's happening here. I mean, it, it, even just thinking about the, we've, we've had almost 100,000 new residents arrive in our city every year. It was a little bit lower this year, but it's been nearly 100,000 for, for quite a few years in a row. So think about a business that has to accommodate 100,000 new customers a year. I mean, that, that would be a, a massive challenge for any business. And we, we operate in maybe 100 different businesses. I mean, we're in everything from long-term care to child services to waste management, to providing clean water. I mean, we, we really are in a, a many, many different services and many, many different businesses. So layer on to that some of the challenges you, you just mentioned, in you know, climate change, an influx of, of refugees and, and the need to house uh, refugees has been a recent one that we've been working on. And we've been working on poverty reduction quite aggressively over the last few decades. So, you know, layer on some of those challenges and it really becomes an interesting place and and you know, lots of opportunity to make a difference. And that's why I'm excited to be in this role. Well, I think, Michael, you've now become one of my new personal heroes. Because <laughs> uh, that's a lot to deal with. That's amazing. Like, that's brilliant. Has there been kind of like any current changes that have already happened that we may not have noticed and or given maybe, you know, props to you guys that for actually making it happen? Well, you know, there's there's lots of transformation that was already happening, and so I and I can't take credit for any of it. <laughs> um, and lots, lots, lots of things that are in flight, and lots of you know, just unbelievably impressive work that's going on here uh, from a customer service point of view in terms of rolling out web services and, and new functionality. I know it's a small thing, but people love it. For example, our parking app. If you if you ever park in the city of Toronto, you can now park pay for parking on your smartphone. You can top up your parking from your phone without having to return to your car. And, and I know it's a small thing to happen, but those are just, those, that's a good example of something that actually impacted a lot of people in a really positive way. And we get lots of feedback on that, that people really love it. So that, you know, that's an example. There's other things going on in terms of really getting serious about leveraging technology to drive better outcomes. One of the stories I like, to, not really a story, but one of the, one of the uh, scenarios I like to talk about is our our ambulance services, our emergency medical services, and how they've really invested in technology and analytics to drive response times down during emergency calls, better coordinate responses to bigger incidents. For example, the van attack we had a few weeks ago, the tragedy uh, mm -hmm. on Young Street, um, and how that was coordinated, how to triage and send people to the best, get people to the best uh, care facility that they can get to quickly. We don't actually promote those things enough. We don't talk about the fact that we're really smart about how we do emergency services. But that's an example of, I think, where we probably have one of the best services in the world driven by data and technology that we're using. And you know, my, my job is really take some of those examples that are already in place and apply those to other, other problems and other challenges in the city of Toronto. I think, for example, on, on poverty reduction, we could, be, we could be more innovative in terms of how we look at that problem, how we identify uh, vulnerable communities, and then how we work with vulnerable communities to make, uh, you know, to create better outcomes for them. That's amazing. By the way, your Green P app is that the whole thing, but Green P, I, I'm a huge fan. So I, okay, I, I don't have any kids. I have just my nieces and my nephew. And I actually had to go to, I went to a Canada Learning Code thing for my, with my niece and my nephew. And I, I'm not used to carrying all these things, these two kids and getting out of the car. Anyways, we, we get into the thing and all of a sudden it dawned on me, I forgot to pay for parking. And then I was like, oh my God. And that, anyways, it was such a lifesaver that I, so I downloaded the app, quickly figured out where, I, where it was. Boom, done, done. I was like, oh my goodness. I don't know, not know why people don't use this more often because this is so awesome. So anyways, y yes, I'm a huge fan of the Green P app and, and the Toronto Public Library services that have 3D printers that I yeah. think I just, I cannot get over how accessible and of new technology that the city has made it so much more easier. Like, you know, how many kids get to say that they get to play around with a 3D printer to make, you know, Christmas ornaments um, out of or whatever it is, or po prototypes for, you know, something that they're building, you know, yeah. for their businesses. Like, it's it's amazing. Like, so I'm a big, huge fan. But anyways, your green, when you said green pea, you made me really excited about uh -huh. the, <laughs> the parking app. Well, and, that, and I'm thrilled you mentioned uh, the public library, because that, that, that's one, another area where I think most people don't know, even people in Toronto, but certainly people outside of Toronto wouldn't know that we actually have the largest single, you know, library system in the world, city-based library system in the world. We have a hundred branches of our public library. Um, we have, uh, as you say, uh, a pretty innovative technology uh, programming at, at just about every one of those branches. 
we brought 3D printers and other technologies so that kids can uh, come to our libraries and access those technologies and, and, and use those technologies to do their homework. The other side of the public libraries, they've, they've really been the leading organization in, in, maybe in the world, in terms of looking at digital divide and looking at digital literacy and trying to bring digital literacy right to the, uh, to the neighborhood level and helping, uh, especially in communities where, where there is a, a more of a digital divide and less digital literacy. So I'm partnering with the public library on a whole bunch of initiatives, smart city related. Um, and, and that, that one's a pretty exciting one. Uh, and, and again, I have an interesting role, but there's so many passionate people around this city that are, that want to work with me on all of these things. It makes my role much, much more enjoyable and, and hopefully we can actually accomplish things. Oh, I can imagine. Well, your vision is just brilliant. So yes, I can imagine a lot of people being excited to be part of this whole new anthem that's about to happen. I know you, we've mentioned, uh, you know, about Smart City. We actually had Dr. Ann Kavoki and I on the podcast a few times and she was talking a bit about, you know, data and privacy and, you know, security and so on. And she was actually saying, you know, how the Toronto Smart City will not be really about surveillance like Dubai and other countries. The Toronto Smart City, as we're enabling technology, is also going to have embedded privacy so that's going to be a really great kind of feature to kind of highlight about what our how our smart city is going to differentiate from others perhaps yeah i think it's a great point i know uh ann and you know she's really a thought leader on this front we're, we're watching with great interest in, in what she's been working on and so on and we're going to work with her on our broader smart city privacy and security governance models but i you know i think your point is really well taken we're our our goal is not to become a surveillance uh, city, you know, a surveillance-based city or a surveillance state. In fact, it couldn't be farther from that. I mean, we we want to leverage uh, the the value of data to help us I- identify and diagnose and drive outcomes and measure success and measure outcomes. But we have to do that in such a way that is really, you know, respectful of privacy and really in tune with security risks that are really present today. So, so we've been thinking quite carefully uh, and security privacy, sorry, data security and data privacy are really the, the leading work streams on our smart city program. You know, thinking about how we create community-based governance around how data is going to be used and what we're going to do with data and being very clear about, you know, what we're going to use data for, how we're going to manage consent, how we're going to de-identify data in terms of uh, personal identifiers um, right at the source of collection, how we're going to work with private sector organizations uh, when we've when there's data involved and what rules and, and contracting uh, we're going to put into place so that public really remains in control of data and really uh, is, is the leading sort of governance uh, around how we're going to use data. I'm, I'm so excited. But, you know, it's also kind of curious to even know what smart city is really going to look like. It's uh, kind of confusing. Like, in my brain, I kind of feel like it's like the Jetson world. <laughs> I always go to cartoons. I don't know why. It just kind of uh, helps me put things in perspective. Like, you know, when people are biking, is that going to be like, you know, they're powering <laughs> solar power panels for something for traffic light? Like, how do, what does it going to look like? Is there, do we kind of have some sort of fuzzy vision? Yeah, I think we do, you know, uh, the, and I, and I kind of come at it from two perspectives. I think there's, there's sort of a smart city 1.0 discussion that I, that I've been referring to, which is, I, I think when you say Jetsons, it's the Jetsons view of the world, right? Um, we are, we are going to at some point have driverless vehicles. We are going to have vehicles that, that are all connected and, and get us in a much more efficient fashion from point A to point B. And it's going to look a little bit like the Jetsons. I don't know if they're going to be flying, but they're, they're going to drive themselves. And, you know, and there's a number of other examples where I think life's going to change for everybody based on some of that sort of infrastructure, physical, how we interact with our physical environment and what technology we're going to use to interact with our physical environment. Um, I, I do think it's important to talk about the sort of smart city 2.0 that I've, I've been calling smart city 2.0, which is, you know, that's all, that's all great infrastructure vehicles and, and traffic management. All that. We, we need that. Those are big challenges for just about every resident in the city of Toronto. And if we can make it easier to get around and we can make air, you know, the environment cleaner and, and the environment safer, those are going to be you know, massive steps forward in terms of our city. The 2.0 discussion is really, what about you making sure that data and technology is used to make, a more, make it a more equal playing field for people who maybe aren't as comfortable and aren't as, aren't as advantaged in our society and, and maybe need some help 
in terms of food or need some help in terms of childcare or need some help in terms of getting some training so that they can get into a better job. Um, you know, data and technology has just a massive potential to help us with those challenges as well. So I'm pretty excited to work, work on both fronts, honestly, but I'm, I'm especially excited to work on the, on this sort of making it really a more equal place for, for Torontonians and making, giving everybody more opportunities to be successful and be productive. Oh, that's amazing. I can't wait. So what if, um, residents of Toronto or, you know, GTA or anywhere have some ideas of what they can do? Is there a place they can send them or, or is there, how can they part of this change and transformation? Is there anything that they can do to help? Well, it's interesting you ask that. The answer is going to be yes. <laughs> um, of course, we can't go uh, out and say that we're building a smart city or we're transforming into a smart city if we aren't doing that in a way that is, uh, you know, fully informed by our residents, right? I mean, we, we, we aren't going to design that model and identify programming and deliver programming and measure success at City Hall, right? We're going to do that out in the communities, working with people who live in the city, uh, who work in the city and who play in the city. So that's, that's, that's going to be core to our strategy. We've talked about some of the different work streams on our smart city plan. The other uh, work stream is, is what we just refer to as resident engagement. Anything that we do is going to be driven by what people want us to do. We're, we're going to be measured by interacting with people and interacting with the systems that people interact with. And it's really going to be a citizen-driven, you know, human-centric design model that we sort of carry through the whole, the whole process. If you really want to get to the heart of a smart city, it isn't really about the technology and the data and all of that. Those are enablers uh, to becoming a smarter city. It's about it's actually about resident engagement and making sure that people uh, are comfortable and people are happy. That's amazing. That I love that. Citizen driven, human centered. So people out there, make sure you have an opinion and get your feedback out there. Be part of it. I love that. Citizen driven, human centered. I'm gonna have to put that on a coffee mug somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that. I love that. So we have, I mean, Michael, your career is such an amazing career from EY, PwC, now this chief transformation officer. There's so much that you have seen and so much we can learn from you. Is there any kind of advice or best practices that you could provide to our aspiring or budding innovators out there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think for me, you say I spent a number of years in the consulting industry, in fact, almost 20 years, and it was great. I got to work on all kinds of interesting challenges and, and really learn how to approach different problems in different ways and try to be innovative and creative about how we, how we solve problems. And I did all kinds of transformations across public and private sector. The, the things that we, you know, if I had to sort of sit back to what were the, you know, 50 big initiatives that I worked on over my career so far, and which ones uh, were most successful. The ones that were most successful were the ones that I was the most passionate about. I mean, you really, and I know know, it can come across as a little bit of a cliche, um, but you really need to find something that you're really passionate about and a problem you you really want to solve and that you're going to get really excited about and then just sink your teeth into it and put everything into it. And, And that's, you know, what this opportunity afforded me. It gave me an opportunity to say, uh, as a you know, new office, get to create, get to create a mandate, get to focus on some of the things that I, I wanted to focus on in the later part of my career that are really making life better for the people around me. I, I live in the city. I'm passionate about making it a better place. I think it's one of the greatest places on earth. I think it could be even better. I think we can all be prosperous with, with the resources we have here in this city. So that's what I was passionate about. And, and the opportunity to, to get into a role where I could really be squarely focused on that, have good access to decision makers, have good access to teams and people who are also passionate about things that they are working on. That's really the key to success. I think for anybody, it, it, you really have to step out of, you have to, you have to find what you're going to get excited about and passionate about and just jump in. Love that. Love that. And you know what? To be fair, we're all innovations in progress. So things are always going to continuously transform. But passion, I mean, that's where your heart is going to be. I love that. So how do you juggle it all? I mean, do you have a personal habit that helps you stay productive? I mean, you've got such this huge type of role. You've got family. I'm sure you've got friends as well. You've got like all these different things that are happening around you. Do you have something that helps you stay productive? Well, I have to say, I, I would say 20 years in consulting, I was on a plane most of those years. Um, it seems that's what it felt like anyway. 
uh, and you know Million Mile Club and all that kind of stuff. So it, it, you know that it was exciting and it was interesting, but I, I had to delay uh, the start of my family and and the start of you know some of the things I wanted to do from a personal perspective because you know you're just too busy and you're away all the time. To, you know now I my kids are still relatively young. The other thing this job gave me an opportunity to do was to really get involved in their lives and and really uh, you know coaching. Uh, uh, their sports sports team and being involved in their in their uh, after school events and being involved in their school and so on. It, it really gave me an opportunity to do that. So you know, I, I have some other hobbies, but you know, for now, I'm focused on my kids and spending time with them. And I think you know, they, again, working on the city, living in the city, my kids go to public school. You know, this is just my opportunity to be uh, be a, be you know really uh, get weaved into the fabric of this community and, and do that with my kids. That's what really gets me excited. I love that. And you know what? It, I just realized you're really designing a city for your kids. Like, I mean, it's mixing both <laughs> your passions together, right? Like the city that your children want to grow up in and live in and everything else. That is amazing. That is amazing. So is there a book that kind of resonated with you that you might want to recommend out here? Yeah. And, you know, I've come from business school and, <laughs> and my private you know, sector uh, business for, for 20 years. So I'll, not surprisingly, Sabin, I'll recommend a, a business oriented book. Um, but actually, one of the, the you know, one of the things I've tried to do, uh, and since I read this book, I've actually I've done this, uh, so this book 15 years now is, uh, and there's a book by Kitsurazo called Never Eat Alone. Um, and, and I actually never eat alone. So uh, every, if I have a free lunch or a free breakfast or a free dinner where I'm going to be downtown, I make sure that I uh, reach out to my network and set up a lunch or set up a, a, a dinner with someone. And that's been uh, just unbelievably helpful to me through my career. Um, there's other advice in the book, by the way, so I'd encourage you to go read it. But there's, uh, but that, that, you know, that never read alone principle and concept has just been uh, unbelievably valuable in my career. The friends I've made by just keeping in contact with people and the business opportunities that have opened up to me just, just by keeping in contact with people uh, have been just amazing. And I, I think, uh, I'm an introvert, I think, by you know, my nature, but forcing myself to really develop closer relationships with people that I wanted to, to do that with has just paid off dividends uh, many fold. Well, I know the first thing I'm going to do after we record this podcast, I'm going to book a lunch with you, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> No problem. Let's do it. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And when you get some downtime, I mean, you mentioned you do coaching and stuff. Is there any kind of favorite restaurants or festivals or those types of things inside the city that you love to gravitate towards? Well, I have to I have to be honest. I'm just I'm a massive uh, craft beer fan, and o- over the last five years or so. Toronto, and not that there's not other cities with <laughs> great craft beer, um, but Toronto's really blue, blossomed in terms of its craft beer scene, and and there's uh, you know just you know tens of new breweries that have opened up uh, inside the city of Toronto over the last couple of years. And there's so much good stuff out there; it's hard to keep up. There's several craft beer festivals. I won't plug any particular one. Fair uh, enough. There are several. <laughs> there are several really good craft beer festivals popping up. That are actually craft beer. Do you know what I mean? Like beer that you can only get in a small batch from a from a small brewery. So yeah, at the risk of uh, of sounding like a, I'm, I'm obsessed with beer, um, <laughs> that would be that would be my recommendation. Is find a good a good brewery. A lot of them have good food. Um, that that that's a really shining uh, industry, I think, in our city right now. Oh, amazing, amazing! And are you a hockey fan as well? Well, it's been challenging. I'll be honest with you. Uh, being a Torontonian, but uh, yeah. but I am a hockey fan. I'm a sports fan. I, I, I love all sports and cheer for all of the Toronto teams. And and most of them are pretty good, right? So. Yeah. No, I was just saying you, you're ca- talking about the perfect DNA, right? Of the uh, craft beer and hockey and sports and yeah. So it's 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 perfect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and finally, how can our listeners connect with you and your team? Uh, well, I, I checked this email. This is the this is the honest truth. I actually checked this email myself. Um, it's transformation at toronto.ca. So send me an email and we will respond to you. If you have an idea or you want to just talk to me or, or exchange a thought, we, we check that and we will respond to you. Awesome. Well, I'll put that in the show notes for everyone so they don't have to look too far. They can just click and send their feedback over to you. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Michael. You're an absolute pleasure. I, honestly, it's a big, huge honor. And I, I look I look forward to actually helping support this whole transformation in whichever way I can make a little difference. Absolutely. Well, I think you're helping by getting the word out, but I I will be calling on you. So thank you very much.
Thanks again for joining us this week. It's been a blast as usual. Next week, we've got a really interesting guest. Here's a quick sneak peek. A lot of people will, will struggle with the concept of putting their money and leaving it as cash or fixed income or investing in bonds. And my, my message is when the market tanks, and, and that's not unheard of, it happened in 2008, happened in 2001, happened in 1991, the markets do, do go into corrections. If you have $100,000 cash and the market's just gone down by 50%, you're now sitting with $50,000 cash. The economy is just tanked. You're ready to take advantage of opportunities, but you can't because the cash that you have has now been depleted and your 100000 is now only sitting at fifty. It makes it difficult to take advantage of opportunities as they arise, which is one thing an, an entrepreneur needs to do. So when the market tanks, you want to take advantage of buying real estate because the real estate market's down, buying a competitor, or doing other things with your cash investing and expanding your business. Thanks, everyone, for joining in and tuning in this week. Next week, you guys another really cool episode i hope you enjoyed the sneak peek i'm gonna try to do this and see how this works if you guys are interested like like the little sneak teasers let me know i'd love to hear back from all of you and don't forget to hit subscribe and leave a review and let me know if you've know of another canadian innovator that's doing something really cool around the world let's get them showcased or if there's innovation trend that you would like to specifically focus on anyways looking forward to hearing from all of you and talk to you next week cheers